Welcome to the Very Occasional Podcast with Morgan Quaid. I'm joined today by a former combat aviator, tech warfare expert, and award-winning author of The Archer's Thread, Noel Zamoth. Thank you, Morgan. Great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Great to have you here. So we have lots to talk about. Let's go straight in with the first word of your first book, Kidnapped. Tell us a little bit about that book where it came from, what was the driver behind that one word, kidnapped? Great question. And there's a ton in just that one uh, word. First off, the book is about a man who can see 10 seconds into the future. And uh, that is a concept that has fascinated me. We, we've uh, it, it came out of a long discussion that I had with my kids, which was basically what would be the most disruptive capability that you would have. And uh, I, I thought that if you could see 10 seconds into the future, you would be the most dangerous person on earth. And then I thought, what if this guy found somebody who negated that? And that turns out to be this woman who is kidnapped initially. The, the reason for that start is like every first author, I had a terrible first draft of this until I started to... <laughs> talking to other authors and educating myself a little bit. And uh, probably one of the better pieces of advice I got is start as late as you can and leave as early as you can from a scene. And that's okay. Don't coddle the reader because they don't like to be coddled. So if you just set something up and you go, wait a second, what's going on? That's a great start to a book. And that's that's how this ended up. This is actually a scene that happens later on in the book, but the results are pretty brutal from that first scene. Mm. And I thought it would be a, a good way to start it. It is a great way to start. And starting with one intriguing word is a, is a fantastic way to hook readers. I, I was very thrilled when I saw that. And I thought, that's it. That's it. That's what you have to do. And <laughs> particularly do for th- that sort of genre as well. And uh, Correct. I think it's interesting. You don't have to start at the beginning and very rarely will I write a book on the I might start on the first chapter, but it doesn't end up being the first chapter. It's what's best. That's exactly right. And, you know, yeah. So that, that first, uh, you know, I call it, uh, I call it, you just plowing, you're just shoveling sand into the sandbox. And, uh, you know, you realize that some of that sand that you so carefully put in there, uh, you had to, as they say, uh, kill your darling. Uh, you, I had this great scene of the character waking up and making coffee. Nobody wants to hear that. You know, they want to hear about <laughs> the most horrific thing. And, you know, we'll tell, I'll catch up to the story later. So that's, it's great advice. Get in early and leave late. Enough with the prologue. Enough with the, you know, yes. the breakfast. But that's very hard it, it, because, it you know, another reason why this is part of the whole discussion, you know, why, who devotes all this time to actually writing a, a piece of fiction that is so long? And and I think a big part, at least for me, I prioritize character over plot. And you have to fall in love with your characters. Mm. And your characters live on the page. And sometimes it feels like this betrayal if you take what you believe is this wonderful part of their lives and say, you know what, that's really not interesting or important for a reader and take it out. That's actually very difficult to do. I don't know if you find that in your writing, but to me, it's difficult until I came to terms with the fact that there are many, many pages that I will write about my characters, which will yeah. never see the light of day, develops yeah. them, it fleshes them out, but it's not necessarily ready for prime time for you know, to entertain. Yeah. And the, the, for most sort of stories, particularly thrillers and uh, genre fiction, you're showing a window into that character's life. You're not showing the whole life. So you, you don't need to start with their birth and their, you know, unless it's relevant to the story. And we forget that because as you say, we, we fall in love with these characters and we've spent so long developing them that you think, but it's important to know where yes, he got trust that me, scar from. This is very important for us. <laughs> it's like, not really, you know, tell me uh, the story yeah. about it, you know. Uh, that's right. Art is in what is left out, right? Uh, and I think yeah. that's a, it's very difficult to do uh, without somebody else looking at your work and saying, you know what, uh, I got this already. You didn't need to explain this over here. Leave that out. And sometimes I found out that that's... Uh, that's a single most powerful tool in improving my writing uh, oh. has been what you end up taking out and being in many cases ruthless about. It. So, yeah, it is a very, very difficult one to learn. You know, there's an old saying, uh, the wise man learns something from everybody. And uh, the reason I started writing this one, the first one was kind of a silly reason. Uh, I've been writing since college, since university. I was an engineer by education, but the funnest course and the course I enjoyed the most in college was actually a writing course. A long story about that, where I had to transfer because I was terrible. And I finally found this wonderful professor who happens to be Joe Haldeman, a Hugo Award Nebula winner. Uh, and he was a professor of our class. And he was the the, the one who managed to really resonate. Uh, what he said, his approach to writing really resonated with me. And that's when I think I really became a writer. Then, of course, you put that away for 20-something years while you have a professional career and COVID hits. Right around the time, and I was finishing this very 
you know, a high profile, high visibility job and economic development. And I just needed to do something different right about the time that my wife goes back and says, you know, I, I, I'd like to go fly for the airlines. So our kids are gone. I'm left at home with a dog. I had been starting to write this manuscript on airplane trips from, you know, between Florida and Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. And the, the genesis was pretty silly. First off, I thought, you know, what, how cool would it be if you could see 10 seconds into the future? Let's start writing a little bit about that. But nobody cares about a superhero. There's too many of those. People care about people. I just happened. Uh, I'm a closet math nerd and I watch all these videos on YouTube about mathematics. And there was this one finished uh, five years ago, but the run it had was fantastic. And it was this young PhD candidate who was doing this as some sort of outreach. Uh, the series is called PBS Infinite Series. You can look it up. And she was just, you know, delightful. Uh, and very, very, very capable. And then I looked at some of the comments that some people had left. A lot of them have been deleted, but of course some of the comments that people left were horrific. Here was yeah. this PhD trying to do her best to be an advocate for uh, for mathematics and STEM education and all that. And people were making comments about her genes and you know, uh, rude stuff. And, yeah. and I don't know why, this happened by the way, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, while I was in Puerto Rico and I'm watching these things at night just to get my mind off the horrific destruction that's gone on the island that we're trying to recover from. And all of a sudden it came up, wow, what if these two people met? And that really was the genesis of the story. So I, I tried to tell the story of these two people meeting. And by the oh, way, the, the big catch is that this guy can see, anticipate everybody's future except hers. And when he yeah. finally sees that he cannot predict her, he is shocked and he has to figure out why. And of course, then shenanigans ensue. Uh, yeah. But that was that was really it. So the, wow. the process went, let's tell a story. Uh, I was very fortunate to be in a really strong writer's group. And a lot of people offered a lot of very constructive, healthy feedback. And it took a long process to cut that down to something that was actually a story to be told and not a bunch of vignettes uh, about a dude who can see into the future and a girl who, you know, doesn't allow them to whatever. Yeah. Um, and from that, you know, it's uh, here it is. And I distinctly remember the first day this comes in the mail and, you know, the publisher sends you a box of copies and you go, dear Lord, what have I done? <laughs> and I remember my wife telling me, you should be so happy. This is the, the fruits of your labor. And the reality was that I was terrified. You know, yeah. I, here was this something that you have devoted, poured your heart and soul into and you just wonder, wow, you know, is somebody going to take this in and laugh? So uh, ended up uh, people suggested I submitted to a couple of things and, and here we are. Yeah, it's it's something that we you don't hear a lot from uh, from a lot of authors. But yeah, the, writing the book is just the first point. And yep. then there's the fear of once this out is out there, I want people to read it. But the downside is people are going to read it <laughs> and people <Correct>. have opinions. <laughs> And yes. at, uh, at this uh, particular time in history, people are, are not shy in offering those opinions, no, whatever they true. may be. A lot of the stuff I write has horror elements in there. Uh, so there's a, you know, a little bit of gore and a little bit of horror and lots of stuff. Not so much knife stabby stabby stuff, but monsters and supernatural stuff. And I'm very open about that with the blurb and all the rest of it. And you, I'm not, I don't shy away from it. It's amazing how many times I'll get a negative review that there's like a, it, there was a lot of horror things in here and yes. they were quite triggering. And but but that was that was the book that you picked up. That was. I, I wasn't I, hiding that fact. In this particular one, I actually, for a moment, had these two reviews back to back on Amazon, of all things. And uh, I loved it because the first one says, I love this because it was a thriller that really focused on real people and, you know, the, this love story that, that happens between these two characters. And the second was, I was expecting a, you know, shoot him up thriller. Uh, why are these two people having a relationship? You know, so boring. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is, uh, I, I I told that to a, a, an author friend of mine, somebody that I'd love to chat about later. And she said, consider that a badge of honor. The first time somebody mm -hmm. takes your manuscript and completely doesn't understand or doesn't get it, that is, uh, you should frame that on your wall because you elicited a response from someone. And, and she didn't dismiss yeah. it. She, she wasn't saying these people are bad or mean. They're completely entitled to their opinions. I thank them for reading the book. You elicited a response. You, you touched a nerve, whatever that may be. 
Yeah. That old adage says, you know, uh, love me or hate me, but don't ignore me. That's a step forward. Exactly. And and it um one of the hardest things I think. Uh, because the the books that get the most pub, uh, publicity are the you know James Patterson thrillers or the you know um, Harry Potter series and all that sort of stuff, and the problem with those is broad appeal. So for an upcoming yes. writer, you just think, well, what I'm going to write, I want everyone to be able to read. This is for everyone, and that's the exact opposite of what you need to do. You need to narrow down to no, this book is not for everyone. It is for these particular people that will love it really hard to do because you're immediately thinking aren't i cutting off 80 percent of my audience if i do that well yes you are but they're just going to leave terrible reviews and they're going to hate it so and, and you I mean, you're you're a marketing guy so this is this mm. has been in any other industry this is exactly what you do you know not everybody yeah. will love your product uh, yeah. as a writer though you know we have created this world and we're like well isn't the entire world gonna love it you know and <laughs> no they're not because there is there are some people and they're not bad people People who do not yeah. like your work are not bad people. It's just that, yeah. you know, they just don't have the same taste. And uh, that's very true. I think that every author at some point makes that mistake. Every writer makes that mistake. And I think every author at some point overcomes it. And mm. I, I think that that is one of those milestones that is part of the growth process into becoming self-fulfilled, I would say, as mm. a writer. When you realize, you know, I'm going to write to that person that I think this book will speak to. I'm going to write for myself. It, it may be some crazy cross genre, whatever, but like somebody once told me, there is somebody out in the world who's going to consider your book the best thing they have ever read. And the yeah. trick is finding them. And, and this is, I suppose, exactly what you're saying. This is where uh, new writers in particular, it's very hard to do, but you need to think of your book more like a product than a work of art in some sure. sense. And sure. people aren't going to buy every product. They don't like every brand. They have things that they lean towards but it's very hard because like but this is a piece of art this is i'm speaking to the masses and they don't want to listen why is that no. nobody really speaks to the masses and, and that's a no. that's a, a significant issue that we're finding out now you know we, we used mm. to live in a world where everybody essentially consumed the same information now yeah. that's no longer the case in this world that that we live in so being able to play that game is, I think, a very important skill. Yeah, and and it's it's important to remember as well that you you have to niche down or focus on a specific niche. But because we're an international community now, that niche is a lot bigger than it would have been fifty years ago, when we were all watching the same television shows, and you know we we were forced in that direction because there was no other option. Now no, there are true. a million options, but the world is a, a bigger place or very more true. accessible. And and. and and you can also discover some areas where you would otherwise not consider going. Mm. You know, some niches that, you know, may be important to some communities of readers that you may not even have thought of. So, yeah, I completely agree. So uh, tell us a little bit about how your uh, previous career or careers as a uh, in the Air Force and, uh, you know, also what your previous role prior to, to writing, how they informed the book, what you sort of drew on as you were writing and editing and, yeah, how that process worked. So I'll tell you a little bit, you know, the, the, the short story. Uh, um, I was born in Puerto Rico, uh, part of the U.S., uh, ended up going to college to be an engineer and uh, decided this was the height of the Cold War. You know, don't age me. Uh, you know, so I'm not. So you'd be, you'd be in your uh, you'd be in your mid mid thirties then. I'd say I identify as fifteen. Yeah. So uh, you know, that's my, uh, <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Um, so uh, ended up flying, thinking I was uh, you know going to leave, uh, and much to my surprise, I ended up uh, having a full career because I was given uh, a lot of fun things to do. I ended up. Uh, doing everything from flying to flight test, uh, flew in combat over in the first desert uh, storm, desert war. Uh, I did space operations from the ground. I interviewed to be a NASA astronaut candidate, was a finalist, uh, you know, did education, taught, uh, did some work with uh, spooky people. Just a ton of wonderful opportunities that you know, like I tell my kids, I'll, I'll read a letter and put it in a safe and the day I'm dead, you can open this up and go, holy cow, he did what? Uh, so <laughs> fun, fun stuff. Um, that the, probably the biggest takeaway on that one is that the people who we hold up in these crazy ideals uh, have a much more, their view of the world is more prosaic and they also have huge faults. And that's what's make what makes this 
dance of intrigue that we've had ever since one human raised a rock at another human so fascinating. It's that you have these highly imperfect people doing enormously impactful things with unimaginable stakes. Mm. That actually informs the writing more than anything else. Uh, little things like the way you find out about somebody a high priority target is usually going to be in a staff meeting somewhere. Although you're going to have the fun screens uh, and all the nice technology, most of what you're really going to understand, it may come in through some email or some through some phone call on a device that you really don't want to answer because you're tired of it. And that's not the plot, but it puts a setting that I think makes the this mm. imagined world a little bit more believable. Mm. Uh, when you combine that with just really focus on some of the worst parts of somebody's psyche, some of the, their makeup, and then try to redeem them, I think that's what ends up making a compelling story. And then the last thing is you end up meeting a lot of very powerful people who are just despicable human beings in this line of work, and they make great villains. It's what they say, right? Write what you know. But um, right what you there know. Are, and, there and it was very you know, few I was of us that know that. Uh, but oh. it's you know what? What do you know? And what does any what any of us know? You know, I, I could talk a little bit about writing. And there's a scene where there's a, you know, a character has a, a recollection about flying. Uh, but then there were other scenes having to do with you know hiding from others in the streets of a European city. And then after that, there was some uh, of the upper intrigue, political intrigue at the upper echelons of something because people are just basically vying for a job. And I, as I went through the book, I went, wow, you know, none of these experiences that I'm writing about are necessarily really cool or anything, but they're mine. They're, they're, I'm writing about this uh, terrible people in terrible situations trying to redeem himself. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's what we all share. Yeah, definitely. And it, um, uh, it informs what you're doing, even if you don't don't realize that you sort of bring your Perfect. experiences to the writing and, and everything and it, make, it gives it some truth and some veracity that people can sense um because you you know the stuff and uh, what i like about the way you've written as well is is that different angle it's you're trying to take it from more of a character approach um and the, redeeming the bad guy is just not a common it's not a common trope in in nope. um in these sorts of books, you know, and particularly in thrillers, it's the bad guy is the bad guy Correct. until he's dead. And then, Correct. you know, yep. we move on. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'm trying to work that. Uh, and, and, you know, I had the arc for the, the series of books already before I started writing. And it was very interesting to go from a point of, oh, you know, this guy's just a, he's just a bad guy. We want to kill him off or whatever to you no, know, the best feedback I, I've heard about antagonists is, why are they in the position where they're at? And if it's just, you know, the penguin as a supervillain, that's not really as compelling as somebody who used to be a great person and then fell or has some of the same desires that everybody else has. You just manifest them a little bit different. And that's been actually a ton of fun to write to the point that in book two and book three, I had to really take a step and go, wow, are, are these antagonists taking over the book? Because, uh, I kind of really, really like them as people and the journey they're going through. You know, you have your character arc that goes, you know, uh, increasing action, the inciting interest, the uh, midpoint, the climax and all that stuff. And the villain, the antagonist has exactly the same path. It's just overlaid on top of your story, uh, hopefully yeah. in sync with your character. And just the act of doing that was really, really fun. Writer's block. Do you uh, Have you come up at that point where the ideas just uh, have stopped? and you're trying to figure something out or you're trying to get to that end point and you just can't move forward. And then what do you do to get around that and get the ideas flowing again? So it, I'm uh, partial to the school of, uh, there is Jeffrey Deaver. I, I saw him at a, at a conference, uh, wonderful, wonderful author. And his view is uh, you don't have writer's block. There is no such thing as writer's block. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, if you're a fireman, you don't get fire block or a physician doesn't have a <laughs> yeah. surgery block. You know, it's your job. Go do it. Uh, yeah. But it is true that you can suffer from uh, peaks and troughs of inspiration. So it's funny. I was uh, looking at some of your uh, some of your pieces on YouTube and I was uh, shocked, pleasantly surprised that my cure for it is one that you had, which is write one sentence. Just write yeah. one sentence and move forward. 
And if you have yeah. that as a goal, uh, then you're probably going to be okay. Write about anything. Write about how the pen feels, you know, the ink feels uh, mm. flowing from the tip of your very nice uh, fountain pen or your very cheap ballpoint, whatever it is, but just write one sentence. And I have found that normally that, uh, that cures it. I'm at a, I feel very fortunate to be in a spot right now where I have a book that's out. Uh, I had to re-edit it and that took a while. And then I'm writing my second book, which I put way too much sand in the sandbox and had to sort of work that back. And then I have these other reader magnets that are actually part of the second book that I'm putting out there. So as a writer who's doing this part-time, who still has you know, some semblance of a day job, I don't have the luxury of not putting in the work whatever work that yeah. may be every day. And f I think for a, for a new author, a new writer who is mostly focused on getting that story out, that trough of inspiration, that low point in inspiration can be a challenge. Probably the biggest advice I could give anybody who's in that position is this too shall pass. You know, we, we have, yeah. uh, what is it? I think the, the historical fallacy, which is uh, at any point in time, we think that the future is going to be basically how we are now. We don't think, oh, yeah, this this is, you know, I'm going to feel better. I'm not going to be sad today. I'm not going to be ecstatic. You know, it's just all these things will 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 ebb and flow. Trust the mm -hmm. process. Trust the work. Do even just a little bit uh, to move yourself forward, and you'll be surprised how inspiration strikes. It's great, great advice. And that, uh, it becomes easier as well the more you write and the more uh, books that you get out because you can lean on that and, and tell yourself I've done this before I've been in exactly this position Correct. multiple times and you Correct. just trust the process and I know I will be able to get out of it somehow because I always have in the past I'm, <laughs> I'm actually at this point in in book five of one of my uh series at the moment and I'm I'm going to do a video on exactly that to show show oh, people wow. this is how I get out of that rut because it happens all the time because yeah. I don't I don't pre-plan I don't um I don't know the ending when I start I'm one of those so you're a pants reckless writers. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. I'm uh, I, I just it, the part of the excitement and the thrill for me is the discovery and being the first reader and all that sort of stuff. And it always works out for me, but <laughs> there's this point at the midpoint, around about 80 uh, 40,000 words or so happens all the time where I just think I don't Where are we going? I don't know <laughs> what how to And this is book 5, so and it's not a book where it, it repeats. It's a journey. So everything has changed and developed and there are certain things I can't do now because things have changed. Yes. So yeah, I'm at that point where I think okay, I need to go through the process and do the things that I do. And um, this morning, exactly like you said, I wrote four or five sentences, did not feel great about them. It's but okay. you, you just got to do it. You just got to get can, it in there. Get it done. You can yeah. edit a blank uh, a bad sentence, you cannot edit a blank page, right? Yeah. And that's aphorism. exactly right it's the whole it's easier to move a steering sorry easier to steer a moving ship kind of thing absolutely right? gotta, rather than uh, let's get that uh, out of there so i i was a a pantser for the archer's thread pretty much um uh, but i knew what the what the broad arc was going to be i didn't have it scene by scene or anything so it's uh, yeah i guess a, a hybrid and then for the second one, I found out that I, because of many things that were, you know, just life gets in the way, I spent too much time shoving that sand into the box. And I, there came a point where I go, there's no way I'm going to be able to put all these scenes into this broad narrative that I had. And I met yeah. with my friend, and this is the, the, the lady I was going to mention. Uh, there's an author, uh, her name is Jenna Kernan, uh, wonderful. She used to be a romance writer, ended up going into essentially domestic thrillers. And uh, I met her at the Florida Book Awards. Our state has a, a book awards and my W1 gold. She's, you know, she's written 40 books before me. Uh, you know, and she oh, was, yeah. I think, a silver bronze medalist. Uh, so we met there and it turns out that this year uh, I didn't submit mine, but she did or her publisher submitted hers and she won uh, the, the first prize in, uh, in three other categories. So I'm super excited for her, you know, go out and read the book. I'll send you the link so your readers can check it out. Uh, she's just a great author. But she's also super generous with her time and mm -hmm. her, you know, her feedback and, and her wisdom on the craft because she's done this before. And it was very interesting because just recently we had lunch and, you know, we met and kind of like a little uh, writers, uh, you know, let's let's talk about the craft of writing. And uh, I told her about the challenge that, she, that I had. And she said, I know you're a pantser, but have you written a synopsis of your book? I said, well, I'm still writing it. She goes, yeah. 
write a synopsis of your book right now. Just stop whatever you're doing and spend that time. I said, well, gee, how long does it take you? And she said, well, I'm a, I'm a plotter. So I normally yeah. take six weeks to write a synopsis and then I fill in the bones. You have enough wow. in that you should be able to write the synopsis now. And that's, that is now my favorite piece of advice. It comes from Jenna Kernan, but I'll, uh, I'll gladly plagiarize it. Because if you're stuck mm. and you don't know where your book is going and you have a broad idea of what your characters are doing and what the conflict and the setting is, you, know, you have the structure of the three-act arc that makes the classic story. Go ahead and put that down as you would send it to an agent or, or somebody. If you had to describe your book, actually write that down. And let me tell you, I discovered so many gaps and leaps and inadequacies of this, and it is the best feedback I've ever had. So I've spent probably three weeks on just focusing on the synopsis for book two. And what's very funny is that 80% of those scenes are already written. Yeah. I just have to, it's, it's like, you know, you have this massive Lego kit without instructions, you started building it and all of a sudden you go, oh, here's the Ikea instructions, you know, for uh, for my table yeah. or what have you, let's build yeah. it. And, uh, and it's really, really helped out. It's actually also really helped with writer's block because now yep. you know where you need to go. Yep, it's uh, it's one of the, so I, I tend to go hybrid. I, I will I will write myself into a corner and then at that point, exactly like you said, that's when I'll start sketching out more yes. detail and uh, and I need to I need to physically have a pen and a piece of paper and start plotting yeah. and that will either get me out of the current issue or it will get me right to the end and then it's just a matter of okay I know where I need to go now it's just how do I get there in the most interesting way possible yes. for readers and all that sort of stuff all right so we're going to move to the next section of the show which is the worst pitch simple idea we both come up with a truly terrible idea for a book or a film or a tv show or something like that um i'm happy to go first to give you a bit of time a bit of thinking time because we obviously okay. haven't had any time have to a, think a pen. No, um, take notes on the goal thing. the goal is pretty much for it to be as as bad as possible that's um that's what Excellent. we're aiming for here so i'm going to uh <laughs> It's very simple, and I'm going to plagiarize your, your your idea to make it easier for me to come up with okay. my own, because that's a good place to start for a truly terrible pitch. There you go. Steal someone else's. So it's about 10 seconds. It's about 10 seconds in the future. It's about a man who can see 10 seconds into the future, and he's the kind of hero of this story. There are world, apocalyptic world-ending events about to happen. There is an alien invasion fleet on their way. Humanity knows about it. We're all getting prepared. We don't know what to do. There's civil strife and all that sort of stuff is happening, and he discovers this ability when he wakes up one day and thinks, how can I use this to you know, defend humanity? The only thing is that ability to see 10 seconds into the future is very specific, and it is limited to one thing. He can only see 10 seconds into the future what he happens to be eating. Ooh. So he sees himself eating something 10 seconds into the future, which means while he's eating, he's seeing himself 10 seconds in the future eating the same thing. So it's a completely useless skill. It's of no value to anyone. It's, he can it's predict only the 10 end of his seconds. meal. He can predict the end of his meal and that's it. Or he might be able to, oh, there's a bone in this chicken. I need to, you know, or there's, you know, there's a chili coming that I'm... <laughs> might have been unaware of <laughs> so that basically the that's the, the first half of the the film or novel is about him discovering this amazing thing while this alien invasion is coming in the second half is him sitting in his apartment or at a diner or something just eating and getting these flashes forward of what he's eating while aliens are invading and the world is being decimated and he can't do anything to stop it and um, um we will call it let's say 10 seconds to lunch or something like that. I don't know. That is, that is a truly terrible pitch. I may have to Thank uh, you. include Thank that you. somewhere. That's pretty wow. bad. You have pretty set bad. a pretty high bar. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm afraid to say that. Uh, so I can't plagiarize my own work. Uh, I, I, but I, I think I'm going to go on the, so if I take food as a, as a common thread, so to speak, yep. and I uh, have superpowers as a common thread, and I have the natural outcome of food in the future. I'm going to go with the gears are turning. A nice. supernatural thriller, superhero, uh, large, you know, it's going to be like the MCU, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it's going to be about a group of garbage collectors 
who gain magical powers from the food that they find discarded in trash bins throughout the city. However, their powers are only manifest so long as they don't shower. So the stinkier and more disgusting they are, the better and more uh, focused their powers become, which becomes, uh, you know, the first uh, plot point is that nobody wants to get close to them uh, when they're yeah. trying to do their good deeds. Wow. And, uh, their arch villain is a dude with a hose. Of course. Wash it off and, they're, and that's their they're kryptonite. Gonna, they're they're, they're clearing... back to, you know, yeah. they're the non-fantastic four. So I've got I have say... no idea where that came from, but uh, that's... Uh... I'm I'm seeing some very very funny moments in this. I, I, I'm seeing them, you know, getting a medal from the president or something, having yeah, saved like, a bus yeah. full of children. Yeah, and yeah. you kind of can't get close to them. Um, if if you if you'll allow me, I, I do have a, a title suggestion. It just simply Ooh. we call them Trash Team. Ooh, it's not great. That's a, but the whole no, idea no, is it's supposed to be not great. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, working title. I, I love it. I'm, I'm yeah. taking notes. So Trash tra <laughs> Trash Team. It's the, look. It's not great. It's not bad. It's, you know, I mean, there's... In the right context, you know, this could yeah. be a web series, you know? it's uh, Yeah, maybe absolutely. That's, uh, for it's got for some large studios, I think uh, they probably do this, but uh, yeah, for somebody, yeah. I don't know. I mean, nice little indie film, that that would be... That'd be I mean, I'm just hey, saying. They've I'd made a horror right. movie about Winnie the Pooh, right? So the doors yeah. are now wide open you know so exactly is, right everything there, there is are no bad ideas purposeful all right well thank you so we'll move on to the final section of the show which is the rapid fire questions round i will start with the first question so in the future all ink is removed from human bodies but it is mandated that every single person must get one tattoo unique to them what is that tattoo that you get and where do you get it on your person Wow. Uh, that's a great one. So if it's in the future, did we have, is this a dystopian it's, future? It's the far, far, we don't even know. It's so far in the future, 2026. Okay. Oh my goodness. That's a, <laughs> I have some unread emails from 2026 in the past. So I don't know how I feel about that you know, from <laughs> three years ago, but that's okay. Uh, so I'm going to basically take, uh, you know, H.G. Wells, uh, time machine, right? So world is populated clearly in 2026. It's going to be populated by cannibals. Because that's what yep. all the literature says. That's where it goes. Yep. Right. So yep. I'm going to go with one of two. Uh, my geeky side wants to put in some sort of very cool math equation just because I'm that kind of guy. But I don't think the zombies are really going to dig that. So maybe I put a big, uh, you know, expiration date on like my rib that's far into the future. Right. So that when the hordes of cannibal eating zombies come to me, they go, Ooh, no, yeah, this not was, yet. Yeah, not yet. Past his age. He's, uh, yeah. Pass him for somebody else. Right. Know, that's, uh, there you go. all I can come there, up with at this point. That's assuming a, a certain level of intelligence on the part of the zombies. Yes. Uh, I'm making a cannibal. lot of assumptions. I, granted, <laughs> you know, this is assuming, uh, flesh eating zombies who basically have a vegan, uh, uh, awareness of their <laughs> yeah. provenance of their food yeah that's that would be it too you know i'm like not yeah, cage yeah. free you know i'm not a uh, not organic there you or go. what have you so there yeah, you go I, I took a couple of liberties with that one so that's your you're you're welcome to do that uh all right so uh can you think of a fictional death either from film or books or tv um which impacted you uh somehow could be when you were younger or, or now uh, can i be super honest with you uh, yeah. So you know, I was reading uh, the Harry Potter franchise when uh, was, my kids were that age, you know, when that's what they kind of grew up with. So I'm going to go with two. Uh, and I don't yeah. know how far apart they are. I think a lot of people are going to come up with very sophisticated uh, senior guests. So they probably have thought through this uh, a lot. I want to say Dobby was uh, was a rough one in the Harry yeah. Potter uh, universe. But yeah. frankly, the other one was Han Solo in the latest trilogy of Star Wars. Wow, yeah, yeah. That was, uh, oof, that one, as they say in another movie, that cut me deep, Shrek. That was, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, father, son, uh, lost son, yeah. uh, all that. That was, uh, I would have liked to see him uh, elsewhere. 
Yeah, and I, I in particular the way that Adam Driver played and was written, uh, uh, you know, as yeah. the the bad guy, was yeah. just the conflict in his face and the almost like Han offering himself up to sort of like yes. I know you need to do this, so for your sake I will let you do this. It was yes, it was it was wasn't. Great. But I was hoping there would be some redemption there, and uh, we had to wait another movie for it to be there. So we'll yeah, back. yeah. And Dobby, of course, R.I.P. The Little House yeah. Elf. All right. So you have to pass on one toy or a collection of toys from your childhood to your children and future generations. What is that toy? Easy. A big bin of Legos that we still have in the house that has actually been passed along to us. Uh, no instructions. Wow. No special pieces. Just yep. bricks of every color imaginable. And you just, that would be, uh, th that's actually kind of a serious question because to be the best gift is one that has no obvious use, but a multitude of potential uses, you know? So yeah. a knife yeah. and a stick for a kid is, is just a magical thing. And if I have yeah. to have, have something that, you know, would stand the test of time, it would probably have to be a box of amorphous Legos. So it's a, it's a great choice because, you know, Infinite possibility. It's only limited there, by your imagination. That is right. There is uh, so no can, end. Um, yeah. And, by, can, and then can, they can also be used as a weapon or home defense, right? You just sprinkle them around your house and the bad guys would come in and start screaming loudly whenever they step on them. So, yeah. But parents so many uses. So, yep. so many, so many uses. So versatile. All right. So this one has some teeth to it. It's our final question. So there are consequences if it goes badly. Um, it's a simple choice. It's a bit of an odd question. So basically in the future, again, I don't know why I'm obsessed with the future, but in the future, uh, humanity is served by a, a sort of servant class that cooks for us, cleans, looks after our children, looks after our needs, all that sort of stuff. And it's an idyllic paradise for humanity. But you, as the decider of all things, get to decide what uh, race that servant class is. In terms of this choice, it can either be sentient AI robots who are obviously self-aware or it can be demonic creatures shackled by powerful magic. And then once you make your choice, we will roll the dice as they say, and see how it ends up for humanity. But the choice is you. Oof. Oh, can I talk about this one for a little bit? Go so, for it. Go for it. All right. So I'm just, I'm just going to uh, ad lib this one. All right. So AI. So AI is actually a part of uh, the, the arc of my novel. So I've had to get a little smart on that. Yeah. Uh, and it is terrifying. So all the stuff that we are seeing from like chat GPT, the, you know, build four. Yeah. That is actually uh, in the big scheme of things, just a little bit stronger than Siri, the, the you know, the voice recognition on your phone, because it's just a large language model. It's not a true AGI or artificial general intelligence. So it's the equivalent of, uh, you know, it's generative AI. It's, it takes something that's there, builds something yep. that looks like it was original, but it's just based, based on something that was there. So a truly sentient robot AI would be super problematic unless you actually programmed it to essentially be humanity's slave, which has all sorts of ethical questions. So I'm going to put a pin on that guy. And then the demon. You know, every fantasy movie I've seen, the demon always finds some idiot who brings him or her the key to the kingdom, and uh, that's it. And once one of them is out, it's like COVID. They're everywhere. So, yeah. yeah. Oof. Uh, you know, the scientist in me wants to go with the demon, but the fantasy movie watcher and reader wants to go with the AI. So... I'm going to throw my lot in with, uh, I guess my better judgment, I'm going to go with the demon. All right. The demon, the decision has been made, people. So we have given control to our menial uh, tasks to the demons, these shackle demons. I will roll the dice and we will see. Is it a 20 sided die? Uh, I was going to do that, but it, it's a folded piece of paper. <laughs> oh, my I don't, and, and it's a folded, I, I kid you not, it's a folded piece of paper with <laughs> bad on one side and good on the other. Oh, you my cannot, goodness. 
You kind of as we say in the parlance, that's a D two, not a D. <laughs> that is a, that is a D two. It's a it's a kind of 50 50 choice. All right, so uh, you decide that you, the shackle demons will look after humankind, and for the first few weeks, things are quite peachy. Everything is going well. The demonic creatures are doing as they're told. There's no incidents. There's no sort of uh, uh, you know violence against humans or any of that sort of stuff. And then you get to this the third week, and at the third week. A child, an innocent child, discovers a book, and in this book it has something, some archaic uh, reference in there to the shackles that currently bind demon uh, kind to them. So this kid takes this book and he goes up and he goes to the house demon because we all have house demons like house elves, you know, so things, and says, uh, "Behalzabub, uh, you know, what does this mean?" And the, the demon, of course, says, "Well, that's a very interesting story. You should just read it out, and I'll tell you after you've read those those words. Uh, also, you need a knife, and you need to cut your arm a little bit, and blah blah blah, all of it." So the kid does all that, all that sort of stuff. All the shackles disappear, and at once, all the demonic creatures are free. But something about the way that that little child reads or misreads the incantation. Mm actually permanently infuses all of demon kind with that shackle in a way that they are incapable of doing bad things essentially so it all goes perfectly well for the future and humanity lives on and on and on I and there are no it. bad things you won <laughs> well done sir humanity <laughs> has been saved when you said <laughs> the kid, kid opens the yeah. book i just said yeah that's that's we're uh, done <laughs> that's how it goes all the time that's terrible <laughs> Well, in this case, it worked out. Um, it worked out just fine. Um, so, I'd like to thank you, Noel, for joining me on the very occasional it's podcast. Been it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, thank you very much for your for your time. Thanks.